Thank you. So, thank you. Jasmine Stone are, is our last speaker. She recently completed her undergrad in computer science at Yale and now doing his uh, uh, graduate studies at University of Cambridge, working under the supervisions of uh, Guillermoin Henequin. Today she will be presenting uh, PCYCHRNN, I don't know how she's going to label it, a software package for modeling cognitive tasks that she developed wh while working in the John Murray's lab, uh, Murray, Murray's lab in con conjunctions with Daniel Ehlerich. Uh, uh, the related preprint is on the bioarchive and the package is freely available on GitHub, which will be shared in the chat shortly. Her talk title is this package which is an accessible and flexible Python package for training recurrent neural net network models on cognitive tasks. Stage is yours, Jasmine. Awesome, so let me get my screen shared here. Um, okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Thank you for the introduction, Maria. Okay, um, yeah, so the package is called PsychRNN. Um, and so as Ishan and Nutita have discussed, there's been a lot of interest in artificial neural networks recently as model organisms that can be compared with biological neural systems. For example, in vision, Dan Yaman looked, uh, trained artificial neural networks to do visual tasks and found that the resulting architecture that developed was similar to the representations that we see in the biological visual systems. Artificial neural networks are attractive because they're quick, cheap, flexible, and they're fully observable. And they allow for prototyping and prediction. In the artificial neural networks I'm gonna talk about today are task optimized. That means we train them to do the same kind of tasks that we ask humans or monkeys or rodents to do. Um, and we change the synaptic weights of the network to improve the performance on those tasks. That means there's no a priori strategy baked into the recurrent neural network. And so once we've trained them, we can interrogate their representations and try to um, investigate the structure function relationship. Recurrent neural networks are a type of artificial neural network where the output from one time step is fed back into the input at the next time step, which means that they can evolve over time. And so they're especially interesting for cognitive tasks um, that require evolution or change over time. So for example, motor control, working memory, and decision making all require integrating information or controlling movement over time. But the problem is that getting started with artificial neural networks and recurrent neural networks is hard. Um, while there is software to try and make it easier, such as TensorFlow and PyTorch and Keras, they have steep learning curves. And even the ones without steep learning or that try to have uh, less steep learning curve so that you don't need as much machine learning knowledge like Keras aren't so well suited for neuroscience applications because the simplicity that they give limits their flexibility for implementing biological constraints. So we have developed PsychRNN, which is a Python package for modeling cognitive tasks using recurrent neural networks. Um, we have a QR code here that'll take you to our GitHub um, and I have links to the GitHub and documentation in our preprint here. Um, on our documentation page, uh, we link to Google Colab so you can try out our code and the package in your browser without downloading anything. Um, so what does PsychRNN do? PsychRNN lets researchers define tasks with some number of inputs and some number of outputs and then train a recurrent neural network on that task without any machining lear machine learning knowledge. Um, you can easily define these tasks and train models. Um, if you do know, or if you are more familiar with machine learning concepts, you can extend the recurrent neural network models with TensorFlow, but we've included a basic continuous through time recurrent neural network and an LSTM, which are the types of networks that both Nutita and Ishan used in their talks. We've also incorporated a number of biological constraints that you can easily choose to turn on or off. And there's some added benefits that come with using a package like this. For example, Using a package like this makes uh, your research more reproducible because it's easier to share the parts of your work that you've changed, it improves code quality. We've been working on this package for multiple years at this point. There's multiple people using it and any issues are gonna be uh, noticed and fixed and corrected much quicker. Um, it's also more efficient rather than writing 
the recurrent neural network and code and the task code for every single experiment you want to do individually, all you have to do is define your task and you can easily swap out different tasks or different networks without changing up the code format. So how do you use PsychRNN? So you define a task. So here's a task um, and I'll show you how to define a task later um, with two inputs. So this is a decision making task. There's some level of evidence for each uh, direction, which is represented as a channel. And then there's a correct output. So here the teal line is higher. So that's going to be the correct output during the response period. And we can train our current neural network on this task using PsychRNN. And then we can look at the outputs from the network. And uh, we see that it matches the behavioral metrics that we see in animals on decision-making tasks like that, like this. We get a psychometric curve. And we can do analyses on the representations that we see in the neural network. So we can analyze the different um, recurrent units and we can do uh, other analyses on these units, for example, PCA. So how did I do all of this? Well, with PsychRNN, it only takes 11 lines of code. So we have some import statements here. We're importing that perceptual discrimination task. We're importing a basic recurrent neural network model, which is a continuous through time recurrent neural network. We set up our perceptual discrimination task. Um, so this is where we could define different numbers of inputs or outputs, um, the level of difficulty of the task, or any other parameters you might want to define for the task. We can uh, instantiate a network and train that network. So we're going to set it up with some parameters that match our task parameters, um, give it a name so that if we want to train multiple models like Nutita did, we could. Um, we specify the number of recurrent units, and then we instantiate a basic continuous through time network on those network parameters. Then to train that network, all we have to do is call model.train. And so if you notice, now we have a train network. We didn't ever touch TensorFlow code. We just called model.train. And now we can test this train model. So we have an, a trial of our perceptual discrimination task, and we can feed this input into the network. And we get the behavioral output as well as the states from the recurrent units. So that's a very simple example, but what if we want to do something more interesting? So I mentioned that we include biological constraints. So for example, you can restrict uh, neurons from being self-connected or restrict the connectivity and make the network modular or restrict uh, neurons to be either excitatory or inhibitory. And you can even fix certain weights uh, during training and not allow them to adjust their synaptic weights. And all of these biological constraints are defined very simply. So in the case of autopsies, a simple true or false turns autopsies on or off. Uh, for Dale's principle, we set the ratio of excitatory to inhibitory units. And for connectivity and fixed weights, you pass in a matrix of zeros and ones indicating where the network is connected and where the weights are fixed. We also include a feature that's a little bit uh, newer. So curriculum learning or task shaping. So what is that? Task shaping is uh, what it's typically called when experimentalists train animals in stages. So when you train an animal like a rat to do a task, you don't just give them the full blown cognitive task. You first teach them to sit in the cage, to poke with their nose to get a reward, to look at the stimulus, to look at the stimulus and then make a decision, to look at the stimulus and make a decision on a very easy version of the task. And then you ramp that up to the more difficult version of the task that you eventually want them to do. A question that is rarely asked is, can this process affect results and how does it affect results? So by including this feature in our package, we want to enable uh, researchers to ask this question. So curriculum is learning is the exact same thing. You train networks and stages from uh, either on different tasks over time or on different difficulties of tasks over time. Um, it's just called different things in the machine learning and in the animal training community. Um, curriculum learning isn't commonly done in recurrent neural networks, and PsychRNN facilitates this. Um, so you can define a sequence of tasks, um, and then the you can increase the perform or when the network gets good at a task, you can uh, move to the next task and advance the curriculum. So you can train on, for example, an easy task, make it more. Uh, until it gets good at that task. And then once it gets good, um, you can make the task more difficult 
And eventually, once you've gotten to the final task and it gets good enough at that, you can stop training and you have a trained recurrent neural network. And so this is just an example of that. We increase, we train a network on a low difficulty trial. So for example, this would be in that example where we had the uh, decision-making task, the lines would be far apart and the network wouldn't really have to integrate over time to do the task. Um, once it gets good on an easy task, we increase the tip difficulty. And we continue increasing the difficulty until we get to the final task that we want the network to be able to do. And curriculum learning like this speeds up training. So if we just train the network without the curriculum on the hardest task to start, um, we won't get nearly as, uh, it would take a lot longer to train. And so I told you I would tell you how to define this task. So we handle the machine learning part of this, but we assume everyone's gonna have different interesting tasks to use. So we've included a few example tasks but if you want to use our package, you're probably going to want to define your own task. So to define a task, you have to define a function called generate trial parameters that defines the parameters of an individual trial. So this could be the difficulty level, which direction the correct choice is going to be. Um, this could be when the response period starts, when the um, stimulus starts, what the delay is between the response and stimulus period, anything that you need to define to be able to parameterize your task. And then we have a trial function here um, that takes in these parameters that you've defined and a time point t. And it has to output the input, the target output, and the mask for the task at that time. And the mask just indicates whether or not you care about the network's output at that time. Once you have your task, you can choose a recurrent neural network. So we have a basic recurrent neural network and an LSTM already implemented for you. Um, if you know TensorFlow, you're free to define your own network. Um, and then you can specify any of those biological constraints and you have your initialized network. And then you can train the network. And this slide might look a little scary, um, but it's just showing you all the options you have. So if you think back to that uh, 11 line code example, all you had to do was call model.train, but you can have all these options of things you can do to make the network train more to your specification. So you pass in the task or a curriculum of multiple tasks you specify any training parameters, and then you get out the loss and the accuracy during training, as well as the synaptic weights of the network, the output, and the state variables from the network. So like I said, you can try this out. Um, QR code will take you to the GitHub. Um, you can uh, try out our package using all the Google Colab tutorials here, um, and we have a preprint up as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. It is, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure many people are amazed with the, how easy that software looks like to be used. I mean, I, I, I try it in, for my task. You have plenty of questions. I will try to ask the, you know, direct questions first, which we can, you know, maximize the number of the questions we can ask for you. Can, can this model neural correlates as output or is this restricted to modeling choice behavior only? Sorry, um, where can I find... These you can questions. see them on the question and answer panel at the down next to the share screen. I'm not able to see that while I'm in presentation mode. I'll stop uh, presentation mode, I guess. Um, okay. So the fourth question, it's asking for the output uh, for this model, the output. Is it restricted to the choice behavior or can we have no, the normal? It's not. You could, you could, um, feed in data that you have. It's not designed with that in mind, but you could absolutely set the neural correlates as the output that you want the uh, network to use. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go through one by one for the most voted one. Joe Pomperton is asking if I have already had lots of practice with library like PyTorch and kind of happy with its concept, concept, is there an advantage for moving to this package? As Jules writes, is there any particular biological motivation for this package? Uh, yeah, so we implement all kinds of biological constraints that are non-trivial to implement um, in PyTorch or in TensorFlow. Um, we're in TensorFlow because we've spent a lot of time developing it, and when we started, PyTorch wasn't as big, and the packages continuously evolve. Um, it's, if you know PyTorch already, it's also not that hard to go back if you want to customize things in TensorFlow. Um, but for example, um, when you have inhibitory and excitatory units that uh, aren't and not equal numbers of each, it's non-trivial to get the network to train. And we've taken care of that for you in the back end. 
Okay, so is there any kind of biological constraints which is available? Yes, yes. Which kind so of I can share my presentation again. Um, so the biological constraints that we have available are um, restricting self-connection. So here you can see the white line in the middle. You can disallow self-connections. You can restrict the connectivity um, so that uh, certain uh, units are only allowed to connect to certain other units. And you can see here we have all inhibitory and all excitatory neurons. And training a network like this is very non-trivial. And so, and we also have the ability to fix certain weights. And we have the ability to combine all of these different biological constraints without you ever having to touch the machine learning code part of it. That looks awesome, Jasmine. And one more question. I think we can fit in in this time window. And yeah, the question is, from uh, how well does this RNN handle value-based decision-making with a goal of reward maximizations across probabilistic offers where there is no correct choice per se? Like one of them is 70% more rewarding. The so I haven't offer. trained a network on this task, um, but you could, uh, let's see. Yeah, you could do this um, by just uh, changing the loss function, um, which is easily able to define. And I would imagine it would train well. Um, for example, that 11 line example of code, that only takes a couple minutes to train. So I don't think this would be a huge issue. Okay, thank you. I will go for one more question. So can you talk about the biological plausibility? I think we talk about that kind of your RNN training algorithms, back probe, some type of reinforcement learning to RNN representation learn related. Do you have any recommendation for choosing the number of RNN hidden units? Okay, yeah. So. Um, in terms of the recurrent neural network training algorithm, right now we're using back propagation. You can sub in any optimizer from TensorFlow that you'd like, though. Um, so there's lots of different ones incorporated, um, but we're not using reinforcement learning here. Um, you could uh, augment the back end to incorporate that, but that's uh, not how this is uh, designed. And there's all kinds of debates around, okay, how do networks biologically learn? The way I look at it is less of, okay, how we're training it exactly matters. The idea is that both these and animal networks are being optimized in some way um, to do a task and the emerging representations are um, what I'm most interested in. Um, but yes, uh, you can always incorporate new uh, learning algorithms into the package if you'd like. Thank you. Um, and regarding the, uh, it, what was the second part of the question? Uh, recommendations for choosing the number of recurrent neural network hidden units, I think that's very up to you. So you can think of the recurrent neural network hidden units as individual like neuronal populations rather than individual neurons, or you can think of them more as individual neurons and how many you wanna choose might depend on that um, and whether you're interested in population level activity, et cetera. But I think we're out of time. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Yes, we have to finish now for our next session is about to start. Thank you very much for Isan, Nutida, and Jasmine for your beautiful talks. The, these softwares and the models are amazing. And many thanks to our audience for being very active and asking instructive questions. I should also thank to Aditya for giving us technical help at the backend. I hope you enjoy these sessions and will enjoy the rest of the Norwich conference and following sessions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.